Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're going to talk about the Battle of Harper's Ferry that occurred in Jefferson County, West Virginia on September 12th to the 15th, 1862. The Confederate forces victoriously marched north after the win at the Battle of Second Bull Run. Marching across the Potomac River in the first week of September, Lee found himself facing 14,000 U.S. troops sitting at Harper's Ferry in Martinsburg. Seeing this, Lee divided his troops into quarters. He sent three quarters of the troops at Harper's Ferry, with the fourth quarter making its way towards Boonesboro. The attack on Harper's Ferry was put under the command of General Stonewall Jackson, who had himself previously been the commander of the Confederate units that were assigned to Harper's Ferry back in 1861. On September 12th, all three columns of Confederate troops began their attack on Harper's Ferry. A total of 24,000 men, with 2,000 men under the command of Major General John G. Walker, 8,000 men under the command of Major General Lafayette McClaws, and 14,000 men under Stonewall himself. Union Colonel Dixon S. Miles, commander of Harper's Ferry, was aware of the oncoming forces and knew that the Confederates outnumbered him almost two to one. Miles took his orders to defend Harper's Ferry literally and assembled on the heights above Harper's Ferry where he was going to make two mistakes. His defenses were going to be static and that would cause problems. This would be complicated with a bigger issue than normal as more than 10,000 of his 14,000 troops were new recruits and had only been in the army for three weeks or less. His second mistake, he broke his troops up to cover multiple locations at once, making an already outnumbered defense that much worse. The largest amount of forces he would place at Boulevard Heights. The Confederates made their move on September 13th. Their initial attack went haphazardly at first as Confederate Commander Kershaw began his assault and was pushed back by the inexperienced Union troops. After repeated attempts, however, he was able to seize Luden's Heights. Meanwhile, McClaws took Maryland Heights. Not to be outdone, Jackson moved west, securing Schoolhouse Ridge near Boulevard Heights. During all of this, Confederate Brigadier General Alexander Lawton and General A.P. Hill found that the Union was not defending key positions to the west of Boulevard Heights. Not letting any dust collect as night fell on the first day of battle, the Confederate artillery moved up to the ridgetops in the dark. There, they surprised the Union at 2 p.m. the next day as they unleashed artillery barrage after artillery barrage. Sensing an advantage, the Confederate artillery continued bombardment for the entire day under trapped Union soldiers. Nightfall ended the barrage, allowing the Union forces to breathe a partial sigh of relief as they still held Harper's Ferry. This infuriated Stonewall Jackson as he had just received word that the troops on Maryland Heights might have to pull back. Union reinforcements had moved forward after having captured the orders Lee had sent out at the beginning of the battle to the Confederate forces. Not to be outdone with bad news, he soon received word that the Confederate forces had to abandon South Mountain, setting up Commander Robert E. Lee to cancel the invasion of the North if they could not secure Boulevard Heights the next morning. In desperation, Stonewall ordered Confederate Major General Ambrose Powell Hill to move to the south of Schoolhouse Ridge and try to flank the Union troops on Boulevard Heights. Hill moved forward that night, and he set up his infantry and artillery in an empty field in the Union rear. A thick fog on the morning of September 15th hid Hill's troops. As the fog lifted, the Confederate forces unleashed more artillery onto Boulevard Heights. Attacking Union troops from behind alarmed the defenders as Hill's men moved forward. The Union meant to return artillery fire, but found its own artillery was out of ammunition. And at 8 a.m. of that morning, Colonel Miles asked for surrender. The success of the Confederates wasn't just in the cost of Union lives, but also in equipment. More than 74 pieces of artillery were captured, along with 11,000 small arms and more than 200 wagons, with the loss of only 286 men killed or wounded. The Union troops' losses were much greater. 219 men were killed and wounded, and more than 12,000 Union troops were captured at Boulevard Heights. This would be the largest surrender of Union troops in the war. Please join us again next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.